welcome to the Farming on Purpose podcast. Today's challenges in agriculture are new, but the grit and determination required to be successful have been handed down for generations. On the Farming on Purpose podcast, we preserve the ag heritage and traditions we built our identity on while pursuing the American dream of multi-generation farms that innovate for the future. Listen along as we share stories of how farmers and ranchers are building legacies, both in their business and their character, for the sake of those they'll pass the reins to. I'm your host, Lexi Wright, and I'm excited to talk with you about the financial, generational, and production challenges facing producers in the ag industry today. This podcast is brought to you by Back Pocket Social Marketing. And yes, this is Lexi here. This podcast has been a real passion project for me. All the time that goes into interviewing guests, editing, and producing the show is sponsored by my freelance marketing agency. We specialize in website design, social media advertising, content creation and management, and email marketing. If you like to take a foundational approach to your marketing and figure out exactly what's working for you and what's not, and really focus on efficiency, then you would be a great candidate to work with us. You can reach out and talk with us more at Lexi at BackPocketSocial.com. We would love to help you solve your marketing challenges. All right. Welcome back to the Farming on Purpose podcast. I am so excited today to have Brandy Leahy here. Um, She is known as the Tipsy Farmer on Instagram, and that's how I came across her. Um, Ever since I found your account, I've been so excited to hear more about your story and what you do and how you got started doing all this. So thank you so much for coming on the show. No, fun. Well, thanks for having me. I appreciate it. Wonderful. Um, Would you take just a moment and kind of introduce yourself? You can be just the short rundown version to our guests so they can learn a little bit more about you and what you're up to these days. Sure, sure. I'm Brandy. I am almost 50. I'll be 50 this year. So um, I live in Southwest Kansas on a, um, a my my husband's, it's a century old farm. So we live, we live at the farmstead um, where his great Great, great grandparents used to live, um, but kind of, you know, not exactly where the house was, but off to the the side a bit. Um, And I have lived here for almost 15 years. Um, I'm from another small town about 50 miles southwest of here. Um, I have four kids and um, I used to be a nurse. And after we were married a couple years and had um, I had my third child. I decided to stay at home and um, kind of did the stay at home mom thing for a while. And then, um, you know, started doing harvest meals and and all that stuff, which kind of then all of that led into me growing hops and um, starting the mobile bar. So, well, it sounds like a really I mean, you make it sound all simple, but I'm sure it was not that in in practice, like as it happened. So tell us a little bit about kind of what that journey looked like. Um, and I did not know you were on a century farm there. That's so cool. Yeah. Yeah. So, um, yeah, my husband and, and his family, the Leahy family, they've they've been growing row crops here for a long time. And um, so he's kind of just um, he's the third of three children. And really the only one that wanted to, to, to farm. So, I mean, his sister farms, but her and her husband do their own, do their own thing still here in the same County and not too far from here. But, um, anyway, um, yeah. So after I started staying home, um, I am someone who gets, I don't want to say bored very easily, but like, I loved being home with my kids, but I just like was always what I like I wanted to do something else, you know what I mean? And, mm-hmm. and, um, taking harvest dinners was not my idea of like exciting work to do. I mean, I know it's, it's, it's very important. Um, and I'm, I'm not trying to diminish that that is not an important job on the farm because it is super, super important. Um, and I still do that job. Although it is, it's just like cooking at home. Like you just get so tired, of it, mm-hmm. you know, like it just becomes one of those monotonous things. And, um, and for me, it's it just, too. yeah, yeah. 
And, and it was just one of those things that was just um, like, I looked forward to it as the season began, but then at the end of the season, I was just so tired of it. And I thought, God, if I could just do something else on this farm, you know, I still have my nursing license, but after I got out of nursing, I really didn't have any desire to go back to being a nurse. Mm -hmm. Um, And so I kind of just piddled for a while, just doing different things. And um, the whole hop thing kind of started as like kind of an experiment. And it wasn't even really something that I was like super interested in. My husband, my brother lives in Alaska and he was here visiting for a few days and him and my dad and my husband were all talking about beer and grow, you know, how the craft beer industry was growing and, um, you know, how, oh, you guys should just try to grow some hops here on the farm and see if you, you know, if they would grow here. And so we bought a plant and I put them out by my chicken coop and it was like a weed. It just would not die. Like I, I'm still really? trying to get rid of that hot plant that I planted wow. up. Like it's on the one side, the chickens peck at it. They don't eat. It's, it's kind of, I think maybe too um, tart or I don't know. They, they don't mess with it too much. They pick at the leaves, but they don't really eat it. Like they just pull the leaves off. Um, but it just is like a weed. It just grows and grows and grows and I can't get rid of it. So um because I did that for about a year and a half. And then, um, well, going on the second year when I saw that it was going to come back and it was just spreading, I thought, you know, maybe we could, we have a little pasture out here just to the west of our house. And I thought, oh, well, we could put in a couple hundred plants, you know, and and just see how it goes. And so, um, so we did, we, we got the telephone poles from the electric company and cut them down and installed the, you know, the trellis work and all that stuff for the plants. Um, and then I made a little test plot row and tried all the fun, different varieties of hops. Um, in our, in our, in our big hop yard, we just had three varieties started. Um, and then as one of those varieties didn't do well, we, we put in new plants that, that did well in the test plot and then expanded the second year to a full acre of hops. And, um, so that's been fun and interesting learning about growing hops. Like I still don't feel like I know everything there is to know about growing hops. Like every year, um, new stuff comes up and I think, God, I should have studied that more over the winter, you know? And I just, I just don't, um, I, I need to make the time to do a better job with that, but, um, it has been fun. It was, it was something fun to start. And then that kind of led into, not necessarily a tipsy farmer at that point, but I had some, um, I I would sell the hops to the local breweries that were starting up around here. Um, and when I say around here, I mean like 60 to 75 miles, like they're not that close, you know, it's not like I can just go down to the, to the brewery and, and have a beer with my hops in it. Like nothing's really close in Western. No, (laughs) (laughs) nothing at all. Nothing at all. So, um, so I started selling the hops and, um, then I thought, you know, not everybody likes beer and I, it's not, it's not fun for people that don't like beer to maybe not be able to experience, um, something local. And so I sent them off and had some made into teas oh. and then, and, um, to hop soap. And so, so I have those things that I also sell as well as, you know, selling the, the hops to the, the local breweries, um, And then I really like, I really wanted to, because the breweries are 60 and 75 miles away, I thought, God, it's just, it's, it would be so much fun if people could just come here to the farm, to the hop yard and have a beer that had our hops in it. And, and not, not, I didn't want to make the beer. I just wanted to be able to buy the beer and sell the beer so that people locally could taste it and not have to drive long, long distances or whatever. And, um, about that time that I was trying, I was working on getting a shed built and all that good stuff, then COVID hit. And so the bank was like, Hmm, you know, that's not really going to be probably a very good idea. (laughs) So, um, so I was laying in bed, um, one night and we, our camper just sits in our driveway never going, you know, I was thinking, Oh, where are we going to get to go camp in this, you know, this summer, are we going to be able to do that? And no, and the summer went on. And, um, then I went on a trip with a friend and we were talking about, um, 
the mobile uh, horse trailers and all the fun fun different things that people were turning their horse trailers into, you know, ice cream, all the different things because of COVID. And I got home that weekend and I just, I thought, oh my gosh, I could do that with, I, and since I can't have a shed here on the farm, I could do that with a camper. I could have my dad help me, you know, tear it up. My dad's super handy um, construction wise and um, I'll have him help me rip out the inside and turn it into a little bar area and we'll sell the beer that has our hops in it out of that. And so that's kind of how the tipsy farmer started. Um, and then after a, a couple of events um, and us lugging these big, you know, huge kegs um, and we didn't know, you know, we weren't, we have kegs at our house in our, in our little keyser, but we weren't knowledgeable yet about traveling and how foamy and, you know, how mm -hmm. all of the things um, with that. And so, after a couple of events and not many people buying craft beer, like they all wanted Bud Light or Coors, you know, just your typical oh. domestic stuff. Um, we decided that we would kind of just cater to what people wanted at their parties or their events or whatever. So, so then we started, we started doing just kind of that, whatever, whatever somebody orders, that's what we do. And we have a few like, um, mixed drinks and cocktails on the menu. Um, and now that's probably become more, um, that's what people request more than the craft beer. So mm -hmm. we just kind of do that now. So still have the hop yard, just getting ready. The hops are, you know, it's getting warm enough where this week we're getting ready to spray the hop yard and try to get rid of, or, you know, pr put the pre-emergence on to help get rid of um, the grass and the weeds and stuff coming up but the hops will be coming out soon so we'll be busy out there pretty soon too well it sounds like such an evolution of just like yes. how it's from where it started with a single plant by your chicken coop to the you said an acre now is what you have of hops. yes yep i have about i have about 900 well Ideally, I think an acre is it was supposed to be like 930 plants. I probably have close to 900. I have some that I I need to replace, but I just, you know, time gets away from me. And I think, ah, I'll, I'll get some cuttings and, and do that next year. And then it just gets so busy with tipsy farmer stuff that the next year comes. And here I haven't replaced any of the plants that, that needed to be replaced. <laughs> so I just stayed Always. kind of around 900. Yeah. Yeah, always something that is left undone on the farm. Always, <laughs> yes, always. <laughs> well, so when you first started and you did kind of your test varieties and put up your trellis system, which um, for anyone who's listening and you are having trouble picturing the trellis system, if you don't know much about hops, they need to go check out your Instagram because the pictures there make it make so much more sense. Um, yes. But when you got started with that and you were testing all these varieties, what was kind of your thought process? Did you have any vision for what it might turn into? Or was it literally just like, this is a fun project and I want to see what happens? What were you kind of thinking at that time? You know, it I I had forgotten at the time there was um, some people that we knew in Wichita that was starting a brewery and they... Um, after my brother and my dad and my husband had kind of talked about maybe we should grow some, we, um, one of my daughters was going to school at Wichita State. And so we um, had went up to see her and had met with our friend that was starting the brewery and had asked him like, you know, if we were to grow these hops, would you be able to use them in, in the brewery? And Oh, yeah, yeah, that would be great. You know, so so that was kind of my idea was, oh, well, we'll grow these plants and we'll sell them to the brewery. Right. And I won't even have to like go out and look for somewhere to set. Like I right. already know the people that are going to take them and, and 300 plants first couple of years is not like you, they don't yield that much. So I knew that it wasn't going to be like a, this huge amount, but whatever we could give them would, you know, help, help their endeavors or whatever. Um, and the time came for us to harvest and um, they had gotten a new brewer and I called the brewery and I was like, oh, hey, we just harvested these hops. And and the guy's like, well, well how many pounds? And I'm like, ah, oh, I, I don't remember. It was like, it was under 20 pounds. It was not that many, not that many pounds. Because once you, once you harvest them, 
wet and they weigh a certain amount, then they dry, you have to dry them down. And then that amount is literally like about a third of what you harvest. And um, so it was just this little piddly amount. And, but I was still so excited to have even harvested any because um, Southwest Kansas is not very kind um, to crops just because we have no, I had no windbreak around any of the plants, right? Like it was just straight on Southwest wind beating the heck out of those little plants. Um, and we did have a drip system, a drip watering system. Um, so they, they were watered, but the wind is just so hard on them that I was afraid that first season, I just thought there's not going to be any cones to harvest. Like they're Mm -hmm. just, they're not going to make anything. Um, but when I called and, and was excited that we had some to sell, the brewer didn't want them. And so then I was just like, Oh my goodness, what am I going to do with these hops? And so I just started cold calling people on, like I got on my phone and, you know, was looking up breweries, you know, within a hundred miles of me. And, um, I called the, the Dodge city brewing company was the first, first place I called and the brewer was so nice. And he was like, yeah, bring them up. I'll give them a try. You know? So he was just, it was, it was so nice. Um, to just, he didn't know me. He didn't, you know, it was just so random and, you know, weird that somebody's calling him up and asking him to, you know, Hey, can you buy my hops? And whether he needed them or not, like he he was just nice enough to buy them. Um, And so that's where we've been selling. We sell them there and then to another um, brewery in garden city. But um, it, I really didn't have any other thoughts beyond helping or selling to that brewery in Wichita, right? Like that was my only kind of goal was just to be able to grow the hops and say that they had Kansas local hops. Um, And then when they didn't want them, then I was just like, oh my goodness, what what am I going to do? And so then that's kind of what got me to thinking, well, what what if he doesn't want these next year? Um, And also there's people that don't like to drink beer. So what else could I do with these hops if I'm not able to sell them to the breweries? And so that's kind of where the teas and the soaps also came into play. So mm-hmm. really it wasn't, um, it really wasn't a well thought out plant. Like I just had these 300 plants and I thought I was just going to kind of do it for fun and mm-hmm. see, see how it went and, and grow them for that brewery in Wichita. And then they've since went out of business. So <laughs> anyway, it's all, yeah, a progression. So is, I don't know much about scale of hops farming is an acre like in comparison to other hops farmers are you guys small medium large what's that like oh my goodness yeah we're so so small and like realistically I I would need probably a total of five acres to even make any money with the hops like I just I don't Mm -hmm. I don't make any money with the hops and to it to so much in fact that the CPA for like the first three years and I was growing the hops he's like what what are you doing like what what is this is this just for fun and I'm like no it's too much work to be for fun I mean at first it was the first year it was for fun but then after we got expanded to the full acre and had the trellis system and everything it's too much work to just be for fun but also I can't have like not that I can't afford to put in five acres, but I don't know where I would find the help, you know, like it's just, it's so hard, um, to find seasonal help. And because I wouldn't be able to pay them very much because it's not a, like, it's, there's just so many factors that go into it that it's not, um, to me, it's, it's, um, finding another Avenue to, to, um, help, um, with the hop yard was easier than putting in another four acres of hops and trying to deal with that. So I just keep the little one acre of hops and, um, and then do the tipsy farmer stuff to kind of supplement the hop yard is, is really what the tipsy Mm -hmm. farmer started for was to help supplement the hop yard because my accountant was like, Oh, you're going to have to do something like you're not making any money with this. And and it's just like costing you m- money, you know? So, um, it always feels good when your accountant tells you that. Doesn't yes, it? <laughs> right? Yeah. And I feel like that's like the story of like farming, you know yeah. what I mean? Like every year they're like, okay, what are you going to do now? Um, but anyway, yeah, no, there's, I think most hop yards, um, there's a couple other hop yards in Kansas. And I think they're all of them between three and five acres. 
Um, they're further north and east, but um, they're we're the smallest by far, and um, and not I wouldn't say super great hop farmers. You know what I mean? Like our our hops are decent, but they're not for the, they're decent. I would say for the conditions that they have to grow in, mm-hmm. but they're not like the best hops of you know in the hop world. So yeah, well, still cool to say that you can raise your own hops, and that if someone wanted to go buy a beer with your hops in it, they could. That's that's yes, really cool. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Like, yeah, they're not so bad that they're, they're not able to be used in beer, but they're right. just, you know, they're, they're not, um, they're not the fun, fruity flavored. There's just so many different varieties of hops and the hops that we grow are just as simple and as plain as you can get, but they're the ones that grow good here. Mm-hmm. Um, and so they're not like the fun varieties that give you all those fun, fruity, floral, you know, notes to your beer and all the, you know, all the good stuff that the brewers want. They're just your kind of typical plain Jane hops. So there's so much to hops in beer making that I feel like, you know, it's like all these things you never knew, you never knew. <laughs> yes, yes. But it's so interesting. Um Okay. So you guys are on the smaller side and when you got started and you were trying out all your different varieties, what, what was it about the ones that worked well for you guys that they just were hardier or what was that like? Yes, pretty much. So I had that little test plot row and I had, I think I had 15 different varieties in that test plot row. Um, and I picked the, um, well, the, like I said, the first year we had different varieties in the main hop yard. Um, and one of those was um, a New Zealand variety that did not grow, like it didn't get very tall. Um, it was real spindly, like it just, the, the vines didn't look good. Um, and a lot of the plants died. And so I went with the plants that were like super, like, hardy leafy like or you know that they had nice thick vines um and that grew the tallest and with the least amount like I was giving them all the same amount of water right which obviously all all varieties take different different amounts of water but um for the amounts that I knew that we would be using because we were on a drip system and pretty much they were all going to be getting the same amount of water Mm -hmm. um I just went with those and and they seem the ones that I picked were the ones that withstood the wind the best. Um, although you know, you never can tell about that. You know, some, some years the wind is, is kinder than others, you know, and yeah. some, some years it just blows, you know, a steady 40 miles an hour every single day all summer long. But, um, then there's sometimes that, you know, we have a couple of weeks where it's really nice and only, only a, you know, 20 mile an hour winds. So, those are the ones that we have are just the ones that withstand the, the, the high heat, um, and the wind. So, yeah. Okay. Cause it gets well, really hot here. As yes. well. Hot and windy. It's the, like, yes. the, like what a blast furnace. The, yeah. It's the byline for Western Kansas. Hot and windy. Yes. Hot and windy. Yep. Um, well, what was it like when you first started and you were putting those in, did you have support from your family to did were like they on board with you trying this or what did they think? I think, well, my husband and my husband and my dad were because obviously I made them help. They had to help me put it in (laughs) because I couldn't do it by myself. But I think some of the other family around was just thinking, what is she doing? Like, this seems like such an absurd project because it's a monstrosity. Like you drive by my, my house in this little field and there, you know, I have like 99 telephone poles <laughs> that are 23 feet out of the, out of the ground. You know, we did, we had to cut them off. Um, and then all this wire that's, you know, hooking them all together mm-hmm. so that the, the plants can grow up and be trained on that wire. And so, yeah, it's, it is a huge, <clears throat> it was a huge project. And I think there, yeah, it was probably some question about what, what is, is she really that bored? Like what's going on? <laughs> and you're like, yes, yes, I am. <laughs> yes. Yes. I'm trying to get out of harvest dinners. <clears throat> Excuse right. me. Is what I was, that's what I was going for, but that didn't work out so well for me because the harvest, the growing season from hops was 
over about the time harvest dinners started. So <laughs> that it. worked out good for me. <laughs> Well, still fun to add something new. I think so much of it when you're when you fill that role and it's not necessarily the role that you would have chosen for yourself, having something and it can be like anything to give you that purpose or that sense of like, this is my thing and this is what I want to do is so fulfilling. It is. Yeah. Yeah. And it's, you know, and it was I wasn't like I couldn't help on the farm, but the farm is is. It's hard to explain. It's, you know, it's my husband has his own stuff, but then my father-in-law has his own stuff. And then there's some stuff that's together. And it, it was just not, um, not handy for me to, to help or do anything. You know, they have some hired hands that do stuff. And I always, I just felt like if I, I was kind of in the way of, mm. I didn't, I didn't want to have to have somebody have to take time to show me how to do this or to stop what they were doing, um, to help me or, you know what I mean? So yeah. the hops were kind of just my own, they're my own thing. And I didn't have to ask anybody other than maybe my dad to come, you know, Hey, come and help me and tell me what you think about this. And we went and went to some classes and conferences and hop growers, you know, stuff so that we kind of learned together. So, mm -hmm. so that helped a little bit too. Yeah. And I think it's so important to recognize that there is a choice there. Like you can, like if the doing the harvest meals and doing that role fulfills someone, then that's great. Or if they want to choose the path of like taking the time to learn the role that where they fit on the farm, that's great. But you can also start your own thing and do your own thing too. Yes. And that's, like none of them are wrong. Right. Yes. I, I, I feel like that is a hundred percent accurate. Um, and there's so many things to do on the farm, you know, so many jobs and so many places to fit in. Um, but I just didn't feel like any of them were where I wanted to be or where I wanted to fit it. Like just doing my own thing was just seemed easier, I guess, even yeah. though it was a lot of hard work and yeah. um, maybe wasn't the easiest thing now that I look back on it. But at the time, it just seemed it seemed easier to do that. So. Hey, it's Lexi here, and I'm interrupting the show to tell you about a new option we have for marketing support for you. I've met so many people the past six months who are looking for DIY marketing support, and while I primarily offer marketing packages and website design in my marketing business, I'm excited to have something just for you DIYers too. So I know you need answers quickly to help you overcome tech challenges and get feedback on your marketing content when you have a spare minute to work on it. And you want to keep growing and learning how to make your marketing work in a way that makes sense for you. Here's what I've got for you. First, you can sign up for a free marketing toolkit, which includes social media post templates, email marketing outlines, video ideas, and a content planner and tracker. And to get tutorials and answers to those pressing questions, sign up for our weekly marketing tutorials for just $10 a month, where we tackle your most frustrating challenges together. Or sign up for the marketing support line, where you get direct access via text message to ask all of your tech support and marketing advice questions. It's like having a marketing and tech support person in your back pocket. We solve website issues, social media challenges, and just give feedback on the content you're creating. You can find those options at LexiWrightConsulting.com slash social under marketing support. Well, I want to make sure we get to talk about the Tipsy Farmer and the Mobile Bar and the like events out because you're doing some of them or planning to do some at the farm, right? I do. Yes, I do okay. do some at my farm. Yep. I want yep, to get so to all of that, but I'm also like, a, I studied horticulture in college, so I'm a little bit of a nerd for the plant side of stuff. So I have to, I have yeah. to ask more. <laughs> okay. Um, so when you talk about drying them, do you guys do that like with a dryer or, or what does that process look like? Well, so we, um, we built our own drying beds and so they're like four foot by eight feet, eight feet long. Um, and then they have a fine mesh, um, wire mesh in the bottoms of them. And so we, the, the first year we just, first two years, we handpicked the hops off of the vines. Cause you know, there was the first year, just the 300 plants and they were ready at different times. And so I, you know, 
pawned all of my friends and family to come over. And I'm like, oh, if you come over and help, you know, all, all the free beer you can drink and I'll feed you and, you know, whatever. And literally after the first hundred plants were done, I didn't know if I was going to be able to get anybody to come back there. Oh, no. They did, but they were not excited about it because oh. it was not a very, you know, it's August and it's hot and um, it is very tedious. You know, we cut the plants down and they're, they're 20 feet long, right? So, or 18 feet long. And you have to sit at the table and hand pick all of these cones off of the vine. Um, and so it was not, not fun at all. Um, but then once you pick them, we weigh them to see what their wet weight is. And then we put them into the hop, the drying bed. Um, and then we dry them down to uh, between eight and 12% moisture. So when you pick them, they're, they're around, I don't know, 76 to 80% moisture, full of moisture. And then you dry them down to between eight, eight and 12%. Um, and we don't use any like additional heat just because it's so hot outside in, you know, Western Kansas, we bring in some air from the outside with a fan mm -hmm. and just use the, the room temperature or, or the outside air and, and run that through the drying bed and suck it out. And, and so we're just, we don't add like, I think there's some places that put them in like a, a dryer and they add heat, you know, hundred and. 30 to 150 degree heat. And they, there's lots of different ways to do it. Um, and I don't know that ours is, you know, super ideal, um, but it's what works for us just because we're so small and it's, we can afford it and it doesn't cost a lot of extra money. Um, so we have several of those beds and um, because they're ready at different times, we can pick the two to three different varieties, like, Usually the one variety is already at the same, at the same time. So we'll pick it and use all the drying beds we have for that variety. And about the time that that variety is dried and coming out of the drying beds, we reweigh them and then we vacuum pack them or else we take them right to the pelletizer and then we pelletize them. Mm -hmm. Um, although we did not do that the first year, we didn't, we didn't have a clue what we were doing. So we just vacuum packed them and put them in the freezer and sold them as whole leaf hops. Mm -hmm. Um, and then we took more classes and went to places and figured out how to pelletize them. Um, and so now we, we take them from the drying bed and put them into the pelletizer and then put them in the freezer until we can get them to the breweries. So, so it's been a process, but yeah, but sounds yeah, like it. my garage smells amazing when they're in the drying. <laughs> bed. It smells so good. I wish I could bottle the smell up and I, I don't know that I realized um, like they're just such a neat plant, you know, like, I don't know that I really paid attention to hops or anything about them until we started growing, started growing them. Like it wasn't something I was really like yeah. super into, you know, yeah. but that's well, there's super your next product. Neat. You need hops, drying, scented candles. <laughs> there you go. Yeah. <laughs> Wouldn't that be nice? <laughs> that would be. And I, when you mentioned, you said tea and soaps, right? Uh-huh. Yep. That is so fascinating. I had no idea you could make tea from hops. And so is the soap, how does the soap part work? So the soap is, um, I found a girl on Instagram. Um, I tried out several different places and, and then this one girl sent me back the samples that were just, they, they lathered so nice and they smell so good. And she uses the whole leaf hop and she kind of leaves it in the soap, but um, it's really like smashed up really fine. So it's almost like an exfoliator, right? So oh. you give the bar of soap and, and you use it as an exfoliator on your skin, but she uses, I think beef tallow to, to make her, her bars. And she sends them like, I, I just let her just, I'm like, ah, oh, whatever you feel like putting, whatever scent you feel like putting them in. And she makes them just, they just smell so clean and fresh. And, um, so you just get the hop in, in the soap is more of an exfoliator. Um, and then in the teas, I found a guy on Instagram and he mixes them. So the first year he made them, he made me all these fun, fruity, just, oh, they're so good. They're so, so good. Um, and like strawberry or uh, peach or, and they you, just little tea bags and they work just like, well, actually it's loose leaf tea. So you you put it in the little metal ball or mm -hmm. you can put it in the little tea bags and make your own and you can make pictures or just little cups. And, um, and it's, 
you can't really like maybe just because I know what the hops smell like and I'm around them enough that at the end of a glass of tea, I can kind of like taste a little bit of what the hop smells like. I, I don't know how to explain that, but like mm-hmm. I can taste a little bit of the bitterness kind of of the hop. Uh-huh. I mean, just because I've even tried to eat a hop before just to see what it tasted like. Yeah. You know? um, so I can tell that the hops are in there. But I would say that if you weren't like looking for it or didn't know that the hops were in that tea, if I didn't tell some people that there were hops in it, they would have no clue. They would just think really? it was a flavored tea. So, wow. and yeah, he's made me so many different fun flavors in the fall. He has, you know, pumpkin and, and um, I mean, just so many different fun flavors. So anyway, That's yep, I smell this too. So cool. And so unique, both of those things to even yeah. think about trying, you know, these different options. So do you sell those um, on your website, yes. out of the trailer, yep. both? Both. Yep. For so the when I go camper, to sorry, not trailer. Yep. Nope. When I go to events, I, I take, um, um, so, so sometimes just to have a fun non-alcoholic drink in the camper, I'll, especially at fairs and, and rodeos and stuff, I'll make a pitcher of tea. And, um, so that goes over really well. And then I sell it in the little packets. Um, and then I bring soaps along. Not very many people buy the soaps in, in when we have them in the camper, but here at my farm, I, um, I got a grant to do, to, to put up a wind tunnel, a high tunnel oh, yeah. um, several years ago from the NRCS. And so I did that and must've been in 2021, December of 2021, we had like 75, 80 mile an hour winds come through and just mangled it, like yeah. just ripped it to shreds. Um, and so last year my dad helped me and, um, we hired some people to for the cement foundation. And then we built a, um, underground greenhouse. Um, so everything is underground except for the roof. Um, and so I have had several events in the greenhouse in the last year and, um, it's been so much fun, you know, so just someplace kind of different to have an event. Um, we have little heaters for the winter time. So it's not, eh, I mean, it's not, super, super warm and cozy, but it's decent, you know, it's 60 degrees in here. So it's not, it's not bad at all. And then in the, in the summertime, um, it gets a little warm in the middle of the summer, but we have vents and windows to open it up. And that's where I have, I have like an open house in the, in the spring and, and sell bedding plants and just, you know, just things to help fund the hop yard. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> really everything yeah. is about funding the hop yard is what, <laughs> what it all is about so that's so cool and so unique though I bet there's I mean that's the kind of venue that I feel like in a lot of times in rural areas like that's so creative and we don't have all of those options of like super awesome buildings or fun venues like that that's really neat that you're able to do that for your area yeah. Th- yeah. It's been fun. And I, I haven't had as many events in there as I have wanted so far. I don't have a bathroom yet. I'm, I'm still working on getting, um, a, a hop. I need a hop shed for drying hops. That's mm-hmm. bigger than my garage. Cause we've kind of outgrown the garage and I ordered a building last year. That's still not here. And that oh was gosh. supposed to have the bathroom in it Oh no! For, for the greenhouse for people to utilize for the greenhouse. So that hasn't worked out so well yet, but, um, the events that I have had, um, at, I, I've had a, somebody came and had a gender reveal, um, and, and that was, that was fun. And then I had a cocktail making class and a Galentine's day. And, and so at this point, people just come into my house and use my bathroom <laughs> in my house, you know, it, it's small town. It's, it's just, you know, rural or they go outside just, just rural yeah. America, you know, you know how that is. So could probably do something creative and on your taxes right off your back yes. as a business experience. Right? I, I should ask about that. I didn't even think about that, but I should. Oh, I should. Well, that's so cool. Okay. So then I know not everywhere hops are considered specialty crops, but here they're probably definitely more on the specialty crop side of things. Do you guys have any problems or are they susceptible to damage from like your mainstream fertilizers pesticides yes i have to be very careful when spraying stuff and i had to register them on um 
uh, you know, in the USDA specialty crop mm-hmm. place, like a beehive, you know, if you have bees or whatever, um, just because they are susceptible to to Roundup and different things like that. And and then I'm surrounded all the way around my farm is crop, you know, is row crops. Yeah. So spray lots of stuff and lots of aerial spraying and stuff. So they have had damage in in previous years um, from the spray from the, the other fields. Um, and I, 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 they are considered a specialty crop, but I couldn't even like for, for the USDA purposes, I had to, I have to grow them for like five years. So last year was my fifth year for me to be able to get any kind of insurance or anything on them through the USDA. You know, I've yeah. registered them every year, but I couldn't, couldn't get any coverage because you have to grow them for five years. So you can see what your, your average is to, to be able to get them insured. So hopefully this year I'll be able to do, get a little bit of insurance on them because I have had problems with, um, well, the first year I had a terrible spider mite problem. I didn't know what I was looking for, but the cornfield right to the South of me, you know, the wind blows from the Southwest. So cornfield just blew the spider mites, right. You know, and before I knew what was going on, I didn't have an agronomist or didn't, you know, nothing like that. So they were, they weren't, that's probably why the yield our first year was so poor. Mm. Um, but since then, I've went to more classes and learned more things. And then I have a guy that comes and helps me and, you know, tells me, oh, you should do this. Or, you know, he helps me out. He's obviously, he's, there's no hops around here. So he he's um, not a hop expert by any means, but but he helps me best as he can. So, yeah, it's, just, it's nice to have somebody else's opinion. So definitely. I think that's such a hard piece of why it's so hard to get started and expand the specialty crop industry, especially in Midwestern states, because of that five-year mm-hmm. rule that you mentioned. It's like five years is so long. It is. Growing it is something really, and yeah. 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 Especially something that's specialty that takes mm-hmm. so much extra care anyway, you know, uh, yeah. it's, it really, it really has been a struggle, but yeah. Anyway. unavoidable when you live in on a farm on yeah. a century farm that also grows traditional crops right right and yeah somebody's like well why don't you just put up a um oh a board or like a barrier around the you know around your your one anchor well I looked into that just for like a wind barrier to help mm-hmm. with the wind and just for like the south side of the one acre was going to be 40 grand, you know, and I thought, I can't afford that's not oh, I can't geez. do that, you know, so I just have to deal with the the resid the spray and deal with the wind and all yeah. the other stuff. So do the best you can with it. Yeah. 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 Okay, well, I will stop pestering you with plant questions then. <laughs> Tell fine. me a little bit more about um, how the camper renovations went and how you st- got started going to different events with the Tipsy Farmer Mobile Bar. Well, the the main way that I could convince my husband to let me tear the camper up, because it was only, I, I think we'd had it for two years. And like I said, we didn't get to use it much, but when, when we did, it was, it was fun, you know, for us to just go to the the lake that's about an hour away and take the boys and be able to go fishing and camping. And, and so the only way that I could convince him that it was going to be okay to, to convert the, the camper into a bar was if I was still kind of maybe able to utilize it as a camper in case we wanted to go camping. Uh-huh. And so um, we took one of the beds out. We left it to where the the bar it would just flip. It it wasn't a state. It's like a. It was a bar that would be able to flip down out of the way if I wanted to put a bed in the floor so that gotcha. I could still utilize it as a camper. And then after the first year, um, it was just. We, we thought there's no way we're going to ever use this as a camper again, you know, for recreational camping. Um, and so we went in and made even more um, renovations in it. And so now there's like all the beds are gone. Um, it's a stationary bar. Um, there is a, another little countertop that will flip flip up and down just to help get out of the way so we can store stuff in it as we're traveling. Um, and my dad helped me rip out the twin beds that were in there. We put a little pantry shelf area for for hauling all the juices and the the cups and you know all the all the stuff um 
And then hopefully like it, once you work in it and then you realize, oh, I need more space for this or this, or, you know, you kind of yeah. then you think, oh, I need to do something else. And so <laughs> every year it seems like we've had to make renovations to to make accommodations so that it runs a little bit smoother. But yeah, so it's my dad is like he's built a couple of houses, like I said, so he's he's super handy construction and can just do anything. So I just kind of tell him like, I want this moved and I want this here. And and then he just makes it happen. So oh, that's awesome. Super handy. Yeah. Yeah. And you, you've been taking it to rodeos and fairs and yep. festivals. The, the first year I um, took it to more probably rodeos and fairs, like just local, like people found out about it and they would want us to come be at the fair. And, um, which was great, except for that, um, as I'm, as I'm learning and, and getting smarter, I guess, about the events and stuff, um, I have to carry liquor liability insurance and I have to make sure, you know, that I'm not over myself or my staff are not over serving people. But when you go to a fair or a rodeo, they don't really control the people. They let, allow people to bring their ice chests in. Right. Yeah. So so I don't make that many sales at a fair or rodeo because people are bringing their ice chest in. But sure. then also if they do come and get a fun drink from me and then I serve them, but then they go back to their truck and have, you know, six more beers, right. then is the liability on me or is it on them? So it's kind of a kind That's of a hard. fine, fine line. And I don't like to be put in that situation. And I have kind of tried to get out of doing those types of events where people can bring their own alcohol yeah. in. Um so last year I did um, more like smaller local events where I could control like where people aren't bringing their own alcohol in um, or weddings. So I did a lot of weddings last year, which was fun, but that's a whole nother beast in and of itself, yeah. you know? So um, that's quite a just large I'm not, crowd, I'd I, imagine. I, yeah. Yeah. And I, it, it is. And it's also, um, I'm not, I, I don't consider myself like a, a certified bartender, you know, like I, I haven't been to school to learn how to mix all these fancy drinks. You right. know, I can do mixed drinks and I can do drinks that I like to drink myself, but, um, I, you, you know, you get a bride and, um, oh, they want a very specific drink. Um, and they want a specific alcohol. And then I go and buy that. And then at the last minute they change their mind oh, and, no. I'm just like, oh, <laughs> sorry, you're going to have to have that drink anyway. <laughs> you know, I mean, yeah, I mean, that has that has happened to me once. Um, and I, I'm I've learned from those things, too. So always every event is a new a new is like a new learning opportunity, you know? So. Yeah. And it sounds like a super fun thing. Like, I'm sure you meet a lot of people and like meet lot, all kinds of cool activities you get to go to but there's also like you mentioned like the business side of it of having to make hard decisions that you don't necessarily want to tell people yeah. no but you have to yeah yeah and it's you know it is it's a super fun super fun business and it's a, a fun occupation like to to be a mobile bar owner is really a lot of fun and the work is is a ton of fun and I love meeting new people um and I think community is so, so important, especially out here in rural America where there's not a lot of fun things to do. Um, and so if you can just bring one fun thing to a party and have it be responsible and entertaining, you know, like it's just, it's something different and unique. And um, I love that aspect of it. And I love that people want us to be at their event. Um, but then also, yeah, you get into that aspect where you have people that think, Oh, well, I, well, because we're friends, you're going to do, you're going to give me a discount or you're going to give me free alcohol or you're going to, and I'm just like, I, I can't do that. Like right. I have to follow the, the, the guidelines and the rules set up by the Kansas, you know, ABC. So I have, I can't break the law, you know, and I, yeah. I have to follow rules because I don't want to be in trouble. And, and, and so going through yeah. all that ABC paperwork is like a job in and of itself. Oh my goodness. People do. Yeah. Yeah. No, jump through. Yeah. just to, no, just, and just to keep the records, you know, yeah. that's, that takes more time to keep the records maintained and, you know, to buy the alcohol and to keep an inventory of it and keep an inventory of what you sell. And then after the event, 
to make sure everything adds up to what is in stock and yeah. keep track of all that is a huge nightmare. And it actually takes more time than being at the, like if all I had to do was show up at an event and serve drinks, like, man, that would be <laughs> awesome. It would be so much fun, but that's not, not how it works. But yeah, that's not all of it. <laughs> no, no. Just like well, anything else, you know? Right. Right. Well, it sounds like you have made something really successful. You've diversified it so much that like there's all these little pieces that support the hop yard and support each other. But yes. what's it like to try to balance all that? Have you it sounds like you've kind of like grown one piece at a time, but you have a lot of stuff that you're keeping running now. How's that? I do, you know, and I am trying to um because I come from a nursing background and have a degree in nursing, like business is not my forte. Like I'm learning, I'm taking classes all the time, um, marketing classes and business classes and mobile bar classes and, you know, hop classes. Like I've been to a lot of trainings on a lot of different things in the last five years, um, which is fun because I like to learn new things. And it is a lot to keep track of. Um, and I do, I have a lot of help. So my dad helps, my parents, both of my parents help, um, my husband's when he can helps a lot. Um, then all of my kids, you know, like I take them to events and, and they're my staff and my girls are older and my, my older than my boys. And so my girls will help sometimes serve alcohol and the boys take care of the cash register and they're my runners. And, and, um, so it's kind of like a, it's a family, it's, it's a family job for sure. But hopefully one of these days I'll be able to, uh, hire some outside help and, and, so that it's not just all me taking care of it. Yeah. Um, because I did, I just recently bought some, uh, some property that I am converting into an actual venue. And so oh, I'm cool. hoping to be able to um, have the tipsy farmer be there a lot of the time and not have to travel so far. Cause that gets to be a lot on weekends, you know, you, just, yeah. you load up on Friday and and then leave Saturday morning and get there and come home either late Saturday night or Sunday. And so then the whole weekend's gone. But um, and it's such an opposite schedule of probably what like your kids in school are on. And yes, yes. And I have this. So last year, just because I was trying to build the the business up, I um I booked almost every weekend. Like I was just oh, wow. every single <laughs> weekend of the year I was almost booked. And um, which was great, great for business, great for getting the tipsy farmer out there. But then I felt like my kids suffered. Like I didn't get to see a lot of their events and I missed out on so many things that I decided that, you know what, I don't have to be at all of these events. I can, I can pick and choose what I want to go to. Yeah. And, um, so my first event for the year was the Galentine's event, um, and then I have a wedding in, in uh, March. And then after that, it gets really busy, but I've tried to not book too many things during like September to, to March when it's super busy in school and sports activities and stuff so that I don't miss out on that stuff this year. So that's so good. I think it's so yeah. easy as a, like a new business owner to get burnt out really quickly from feeling like you have to do it all. So yes, that's so good. Yes. You're able to kind of draw some lines in the sand of like, this is when we're going to take time for us. Yeah. Yeah. And I hate telling people no. And I hate, um, I hate to not be at their event, but then I hate to miss my kids' stuff even yeah. more. You know what I mean? Yeah. So I'm like, yeah, they'll just be in school a few more years and then I can be at all the tipsy farmer events, you know? Yeah. So. Well, I'm so cool that they've gotten to come with you to so many events. I'm sure that's really cool as a family to, I'm sure sometimes not always perfect. If you were to ask them a couple of times, they would probably have chose to do other things, you know, <laughs> they miss things with their friends or whatever. But then at the end of the event, um, I let them split the tips usually. And, and especially for the boys, like that's so much fun for them. They get, you know, the tip money or whatever. Yeah. And, and it has taught them people skills and it has taught them how to count back money and how to, I mean, they're better at the little computer system than I am by far, but, um, but it's, it's taught them a lot of, um, a lot of good skills. I feel like that they can use in, in life, you know, whether they end up doing something in that field or not, like it's, it's been beneficial to them yeah. regardless of whether they get paid or not. So, yeah. 
<laughs> well, it sounds amazing. Um, the way you describe it and looking at your Instagram, it just looks like so much fun. And I know it's a lot of work, but goodness, it's it's so cool. You're so creative, all of the different things that you've brought together. Oh, thank you. I appreciate that. You know, what's the hardest part is keeping up with Instagram. Like <laughs> I'm just, maybe it's my age, but the technology and having to come up with a post to, to put on Instagram, because there's so many times that I want to just put on the stuff about my, like the farm, our family farm or my kids or, but it's kind of like a, a business account, uh-huh. but it's too much work to keep up with several accounts. And so yeah. I know that I don't utilize it to like, it's supposed to be utilized for a business account, you know, like, you know, the whole tipsy farmer show, you know, mobile bar stuff. But, um, then I get to thinking, well, it's my page. I can do whatever I want, you know, right. <laughs> but, but still at the same time, just trying to, uh, beat the algorithm and get it to where people can, can see that it's a, an actual business and whatever that is yeah. hard. It's so hard to do that stuff. And I think it's the same with any kind of social marketing, especially for like solopreneurs who are doing it all themselves. Like it's just another thing to check off the list. And there's so yes. much pressure around it of like, well, is this what I'm supposed to be doing here? Right. Is this actually yeah. like the best use of my time. I don't particularly like doing it all the time. It's yes. so hard. So hard. Well, and then when you factor in age and the fact, you know, I didn't grow up on tablets or phones or you know what I mean? Like that wasn't, yeah. in, it wasn't something that I I'm used to. Mm-hmm. And, um, so trying to utilize technology and try to be creative and try to figure out how to make a reel and put music to, and all of the things, yes. um, it's not that I can't do it because I can, it just takes extra time. Right. And the extra time I feel like I could be utilizing to do so many more fun things than trying to figure out how to make a reel on Instagram, you know, Mm -hmm. that 12 people are going to see and really doesn't matter that those two, like those 12 people are either already my customers or they're my family. And I I don't know. Yeah. It's just one of those things that you're just like, do I waste the time to do it? Or I I don't know, you know? Yeah. Marketing is is such a thing to like, so hard to figure out what works for you. And then so hard to stay out of your own head to do yes. it like you want it to work for you. Yeah. Mark, it's just a beast, really. Marketing it really is. is. Just a, yeah. Yeah. The beast. Well, thank you so much for sharing your story with this. Um, I'm sorry, we kind of went past um, our little hour here, but this has been... Oh, this- Wonderful. Well, that's because I talk a lot. I'm sorry, Lexi. Oh, it's so good. You, I love the detail you go into and how much you're willing to share your story and what you've experienced. Um, well, I do have a couple of questions to wrap us up here. Um, if if you had any advice to anyone who's wanting to start maybe a non-traditional business, especially one related to farming, what would you suggest to them or what have you learned that you would like to share with them? Um, You know, I would probably say that if it's, something that interests you um and whether it's traditional or non-traditional like just do it just give it a try and I mean what the worst is going to happen the worst thing that's going to happen is that you're going to fail right and and if you fail then you've at least learned something from that failure right like Mm -hmm. learn that maybe you didn't like it as much as you thought or that you can't do it in that way but maybe you found a better way to do it and so um I feel like, yeah, just, just do it. Like you're just not getting any younger and you only live once and you might as well just give it a try. If it makes you happy, just, just do it. And it maybe not always work out the way that you want it to, but that's okay too. So. Great advice. Thank you so much for sharing that. Yeah. Thanks for having me. Yeah. And I told you at the beginning, we would, or I, one of the questions I always like to ask on here is something that you um, either have learned from having grown up in agriculture or that you do that you want to pass on to be it your kids or just people involved in agriculture in general. What have you come up with an answer as we've been talking? Well, you know, I didn't grow up in agriculture. So okay. I I grew up in just a little small town. My dad was um, worked at a gas company and my mom worked in town. My grandparents lived on a farm. And so I visited them frequently. So farming was not, um, not new to me by any means. Um, but uh, 
gosh, that's so hard. It is. To, it's such a hard question, but um, I don't know. I, I guess just to like go with your gut and go with, like I said, try, just try new things. Do, do whatever you think will make you happy. And, um, and, and it's okay. It's okay to fail and it's okay to have to pick yourself up and try again or do something different. And, and, um, it's just, I don't know. It's, it's fun to try new things. It's hard to try new things. Um, but then if they succeed, then, I mean, it's an awesome feeling, you know, it's yeah. like, I feel like everybody can do hard things. Agriculture is super, super hard. Um, in all aspects of agriculture, whether you are a rancher or a row crop farmer, or, you know, a little piddly one acre hop farmer, like it's, it's all hard. Right. And yeah. mine's not any harder than any, than my husband's farm. Um, but I, yeah, I just, I feel like just trying new things and just kind of trial and error and see what works and, and it's okay to fail. So, yeah. Well, I think that's a message that so many in agriculture need to hear. Um, or in any kind of business, really, I think we get pretty hung up sometimes on the, well, what if it fails, then what? And it's like, well, you'll right. do, you'll try something else. <laughs> you'll do yeah, something then you, different. Yeah, then you've learned that that doesn't work and you can try to figure out what does work. And and then you've learned something about yourself as well, you know? Yeah. So, mm-hmm. or I, f- I feel like you have, so, or I feel like I have in my failures. So, because the, the hop yard that, that first year, if I would have just given up like oh the brewery didn't want my hops then I what am I gonna do you know like yeah then I wouldn't have the tipsy farmer and then I wouldn't have you know like there's just so many there's so many things that it, it could have went a different way but just yeah. you know sometimes failures are they happen for a reason so right well and I think about that like you said you had probably like less than 20 pounds of hops that first mm-hmm. year how many people would have just thrown those away and gone on with life and been like well mm-hmm whatever. I, you don't even know how seriously I considered that as I was, but I was just like, Oh my gosh, I've just spent this whole entire summer. Like yeah. I've been out here eight hours every day, <sighs> baby in these stupid plants. And I've just had all these people help me pick them. Like I can't throw them away. I at yeah. least have to try to give them to somebody. Even if I have to give them away, like even if I can't sell them, right. if I can just get somebody to take them, then I'll feel better yeah. about having all these people here to help me harvest them. Um, but yeah, he was so awesome to, to take them for me. And then that just perpetuated the next, you know, like it was just, it was almost a huge failure, but, but it wasn't. So you kept going and it yeah, yeah. worked out really it well did. for you. I yeah, think. <laughs> it worked out really great. So, well, good. Well, if folks want to follow along with you, learn more about you, where's the best place for them to connect with you after this? Probably, probably on Instagram. I'm, I, I, like I said, technology is hard for me. So I don't do all, like, I don't do all the things because it's just, it's too much. Yeah. Um, so Instagram at the dot tipsy dot farmer, um, is where I'm at. And it, it, I am on Facebook as well, but I just, I don't get on there that much. So. Sure. Well, thank you so much for sharing your story today. Yeah. Thanks so much for having me.